Welcome to Uncage, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from across the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we're speaking with Adam Benjamin. Hey, Adam, how are you? Hello, Ben. How are you? I am well. Adam is the founder at Launch Lab Consulting, which helps tech companies of any size scale their teams to deliver special project ambitions or specific project ambitions. They're working with network of contractors around the world and offshore partners to bring affordable, fully assessed talent to their clients to help to deliver projects augmenting their existing teams. I know that offshoring, outsourcing is the name of the game right now. It's definitely evolved a lot. So I'm excited to talk to you more about what you and the team at Launch Lab Consulting are working on. But before we get there, tell me a little bit about you and how your career has evolved. Sure. So started my career, left university, went into advertising, actually, working as an account exec, an account manager, working for some cool brands like PlayStation was fun. So I was an account man, kind of uh, bridging the gap between the creatives and, and our clients, but wanted to get closer to technology. And so made the jump and joined the Accenture grad uh, scheme at the time and got trained by Accenture and worked in project and program management for them, initially in finance and then in media sectors and landed at one client who I was really enjoying working for. It was a, a actually a project, a joint venture at the time between the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, and, and a couple of uh, internet service providers in the UK, BT and TalkTalk. Talk. It was a project called Project Canvas. And I was working as a, an account manager there, project managing the integration of those apps, so those partners' apps, into this t new TV platform. That project became a business called UView, and I actually left Accenture and joined UView and worked my way up through a number of roles to a head of delivery role there. But then my wife uh, decided she wanted a career change and, and I had to think about it and I'd probably done enough time at UVU. So I decided I was going to go and uh, be a contractor for a while. Contracted for a few years, went and contracted for BT. I contracted back at, at UVU on a specific project for them. Well, that was between 2018 and 2020. And there was a new piece of legislation coming in in the UK, actually evolving a piece of legislation called IR35 which looks at whether a contractor should be considered an employee for tax purposes. There's a whole bunch of uh, criteria that you have to meet. And if at the time you were considered a, an employee for uh, tax purposes, it would be the contractor's responsibility to pay the government, HMRC in the UK, the tax difference that they haven't gained from your, uh, from your employment or, or deemed employment. But the legislation was changing such that it made the responsibility the responsibility of clients, the end client. So this changing legislation forced companies to consider whether, whether they were going to engage contractors. My view at the time was companies should always have access to ex you know, exceptional talent. Contractors are a, are a source of that. Mm -hmm. and they provide great flexibility to, to economies, particularly in the tech industry. The alternatives are you can go and work, you can go and find employees who act as a long-term cost against your bottom line, or you can go and engage a traditional consultancy, but those can be really expensive. But companies were turning away from contractors en masse because of the risk of a massive bill coming in from the government. So I thought that sounded a bit, well, change is always a, an opportunity, right? So I set up Launch Lab with the belief that clients need access to flexibility and high quality talent. And that has remained at our core throughout, even though the company's evolved a little bit. And that's really where Launch Lab is focused on right now, right? Really delivering clients that kind of scaled, the way to scale their teams as quickly as possible and flexibly as possible. I, I love that area. Uh, tell me a little bit more on how that's evolved and, and where you guys are focused on right now. Our initial ambition was to focus on removing the barrier of IR35. But then COVID happened, and that was a huge equalizer. People were suddenly working from home, and we had the realization that it didn't really matter too much whether you were based in Ballum in London, or in Bucharest, or Bialystok, or Buenos Aires. And quite quickly for us, whilst COVID was happening, focusing solely on UK contractors kind of felt a little bit, a, a little bit narrow. In mm -hmm. conjunction with that, 
in the UK and around the world at the moment, there's a massive skills gap, particularly in technology. That was compounded in the UK by Brexit. And that skills gap was exaggerated by COVID further with the sort of great resignation kind of across the world where people have been considering, you know, do I really want to do this, this job forever? I want to go and do different things. My work needs to have meaning, needs to have purpose. So for those who've remained in technology, there's been fierce competition for those skill sets. So we started to consider that actually remote working is here to stay and it doesn't have to uh, simply be onshore skills that we focus on. So we've evolved. So we're much broader than originally in our execution, but our vision is, is pretty much the same. So we're focused on still working with UK contractors, but also we have a global network of contractors and software partners who we work with to bring our clients access to the best talent around the world. So you know, usually if you're working just with HR, they'd go and, and source contractors. Perhaps you even got an HR team who'll go and source from around the world. But you usually wouldn't have access to the benches of software companies who are operating in, in other markets. Yeah. Um, so you had a commercial agreement with them. We do. And we access their bench and then we assess their talent every time we get a brief for our clients. So, you know, for many companies, the idea of kind of traversing the globe to find and assess talent is a terrifying one, particularly on a project by project basis. You know, I remember, Adam, the last time that, you know, we spoke a bit, you highlighted that assessment process. And I think that's a big differentiator for you guys, right. which is. I think there's a lot of companies that just randomly kind of grab people <laughs> and just making sure that they that people have the skills that they say they do. One thing that I really resonated with me was that focus on uh, almost like a technology translation or communication, you know, the ability that those groups can work within the structures of, let's say, a local market like the UK. You're absolutely right. We aren't, I suppose, a traditional recruitment agency. Two probably key points of differentiation there, as you say, we really assess the talent at a technical level. We are people who have all been on the other side of project delivery. Uh, my background, as I've said, is project program delivery management. Um, it's the same for the whole team here. We've got engineers who work with us, who drive our assessment process, but we've been on the other side. So we've worn those shoes. And we understand what it's like to be at the coal space in a project. And we, you know, use our experience and ensure that we're staying ahead of all the latest technologies with our team so that we can assess, as you say, the talent that we're bringing in for our clients. So we, we ensure not just cultural fit, not just soft skills fit, not just the sort of skills match on a CV level, but a really deep knowledge of technology so that we're, you know, we take away that burden from our clients when they're looking to augment their teams, they don't have to do the assessment process themselves. We do it for them. We also ensure that we're, we keep our, our we've, we've engaged a kind of peer-to-peer -peer lending economy model, right? We have partners, so we don't have a bench ourselves. We keep our costs pretty lean, so we don't accrue costs ourselves. So we can keep our costs to our clients relatively affordable. You know, we give them access to talent they wouldn't be able to access otherwise. We ensure our terms are really scalable. We know that during project delivery, requirements change, right? No yeah. project is at its completion as you envisaged it right at the start. Things happen and you need to evolve the team that you've got on the ground. So we ensure- So, so I mean, we're seeing a lot of evolution right now in technology. I'd say, you know, here we are talking at the beginning of 2023, machine learning has exploded back on the scene. Everyone talking about things like chat GPT, you know, certainly that need for a data-driven business, database science, Tell me what's the hot area? Where are companies looking to bolster their teams? What type of talent are they looking for? Yeah, good question. So, well, you've named a few of them. So mm -hmm. for sure, machine learning, deep learning are fields that are exploding at the moment. Data and analytics, anything in that domain, We've got more data at our fingertips than we've ever had. And we need specialists who know how to cut and use that data to gain insights. It's great having the data, but you need... We need people who know how to, one, collect it and use it. So any data scientists, data engineers, cybersecurity specialists, okay. you know, cybersecurity and different attack vectors are evolving all the time. We need people who are staying, who are at the cold space there. DevOps, DevOps specialists particularly needed. There's a definite shortage of DevOps specialists onshore. But I would say as well as niche skills, 
you know, the kind of languages and frameworks that most people have heard of are, are you know, there's still a deficit there. With Angular 2, Angular JS, React, React Native, .NET Core, Spring. We don't have the engineers in this country uh, for the demand. I think anyone who's a full stack engineer is in a is in a good position. You know, there's there's a deficit of back end engineers, architects. I could go on, but there's a whole raft of skills. Adam, when you look at some of your customers, it just this is kind of perhaps almost like a impossible observation, but perhaps it's different for companies of different sizes. But what would be the percentage of developers that they would be outsourcing versus having in-house? What is the relationship between the in-house team and those outsourced developers? Yeah, as you say, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. It's different for yeah. every client. I think we're seeing more and more clients starting to say, you know what, like this retention, like it, this um, sort of retention challenge is so difficult at the moment. We have to focus on our core team. We know this is a project that only has a limited lifespan. You know, let's engage companies like Launch Lab to scale up on a short term basis. So we're seeing that become more and more common. There are some that are dipping their toe, so who are only bringing in a few developers, say, you know, single digit percentages to add to their team. But others have massive change transformation projects and, and need to bring on 10, 20 engineers to bolster what they've got in-house. Wow. But they know they only need that for a short period of time. So it's difficult to put a, a number on it, but yeah, it, it's definitely a, a challenge. For us, I think the key, though, is... You know, companies should be thinking about if I've got one pound to spend on retention, let's make sure that pound is spent on the right individual. Of course, we'd love to retain our whole team, but we know that there's going to be turnover. So let's ensure we identify the key people we need for the long term mm -hmm. and identify who we just need on a project by project basis. And I think that mm -hmm. is, you know, that is really how mindset needs to change a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I also think that it changes the skill sets of a successful full-time employee, strangely enough, because mm -hmm. in just my personal experience has been that the, the developers that we keep in-house, they really need to be good at working with those outsourced teams and, and being able to manage that process and developing almost like a, a culture, a shared culture between the two is so important. Yeah. I've seen it kind of magically happen a little bit, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, for sure. I think if you're, you know, if, if you're a permi these days, you've got to be great in knowledge transfer. You've got to be a great communicator. I think it works the same both ways, right? You know, if yeah. you're joining the project, you've got to ramp up fast. So that's something we, we, we test and ensure that, you know, the people that we're bringing in to our clients to work within their project infrastructure, you know, are going to be able to onboard fast. They're going to be able to ramp up quick. But yeah, for sure. I think, I think you're absolutely right. There is a need to keep people in-house who are really good communicators, who are good trainers, who have designed great onboarding processes. And we, and we can help with that, right? You know, we've got our own in-house team who can assess an onboarding process and and review whether it's 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 going to allow people to ramp up fast. So I'd be curious, you know, we have here a lot of recessionary discussion right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of tech companies are laying off tens of thousands in the, in, you know, in the states. I think the news to this morning was Spotify laid off 6,000 of their folks. How does that impact your business? Does it offer more opportunities or does it challenge things? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Again, I think that, listen, there's the, it's the same here in the UK, right? There's a, there's a lot of movement in the market. I'd say it's a really fast moving market today. There are redundancies being made. I think businesses need to decide if they want to, if they're in a, if their business is in a position to take on um, a permanent employee and permanent OPEX cost, or they just need someone on a short to medium term basis. For sure, there are, you know, there are more skills in the market today, but I think it's easy to react and say, well, I'm, you know, I'll be able to find what I need because redundancies have been made. The skills gap is massive. I don't think it's the case that, you know, a, a few thousand people arriving kind of an available on the market is going to close the gap we need. Technologies are moving so quick today that the gap is just getting wider and wider. There's a need for training for sure to close that skills gap, but I don't think that's going to close it. And the, the sudden availability of 
some people on the market, you know, that's great and that will help, but I don't think it gets the whole way there. I think companies today have to look forwards, not backwards. There's a lot of companies that you're right, are making redundancies. We're also saying right back into the workplace. It would be really interesting to see the data that they've uh, they've based those decisions on. But I think, you know, remote working has to be here to stay. We have to look globally. It's such an interesting one, Adam. I mean, it drives me bananas to see some of that (laughs) stuff. And these are extremely influential CEOs making these comments. Probably the most notable is Jamie Dimon, who runs one of the larger banks. You know, Dimon's comments have very much been remote work doesn't work. You have to have everyone back in the office. And, And you realize that it's kind of a combination of a couple of things, like old school thinking, really old school thinking. Um, in his particular case, there seemed to be also just kind of like this idea like, oh, well, women can work at home. It was like crazy, you know, but so there's things like that. But the reality is that successful businesses have to adapt to the way that t- talent wants to work. Right. I don't know any person that wants to be in an office nine to five all the time ever anymore like that would be almost kind of like it would be so out of touch with how technology has changed our world and certainly i think the one thing that i've learned is that we have to engage the whole self the whole person the whole talent and not just think of them as a component i.e oh they do this this job and that's all they are you really have to think about the whole person now. And that's that's quite a, i.e. that they might have kids, that they have right. a different right. schedule, that they have to balance their schedule with their partner. I don't know how any young person would want to work at a company that demanded they be in the office 24-7. Now, that being said, I will say, being in the office partially, totally agree with it makes sense completely to me in the sense that there's learning that you get from face to face and working but the idea of mandating that oof, all the time I, I, oof, it's ugly for me as you say it gives people balance to their lives and to challenge that is difficult particularly when we're in we're facing such a with, with such pressures on on talent supply right so Work has also got to be meaningful, varied, challenging, purposeful. COVID's made us all realize that. We don't want to work on things that don't interest us. But yeah, we need to we need to give people flexibility, I think. And even if you put the people argument to one side, I think even if you, you know, everyone went back into the office, you know, as it was a few years ago, I still think there's a skills gap, right? We yeah. still don't have the skills in this country, at least, to satisfy the demand. So you've got to look global and you've got to support remote because you're not going to fly people in en masse to do the work and we can make remote work. We just have to, well, I think it works. It works great for people, for many people already today, but with continued investment, you know, there's some great companies out there doing some great work to try and improve, you know, remote working environments. Adam, 2023, here we are. I mean, give me the things that you're excited about for this year. I think, you know, for us, we are excited about our growth story as a business. We're excited to continue to be working with new clients and keen to discover, you know, alternative methods of engaging, you know, engaging top tier talent for them. I think for us, you know, our purpose is to kind of break down those barriers that prevent top talent from being able to engage with challenging work for them and for our clients to be able to access those you know that top talent we want to break down those barriers so you know this year that's about continuing to work through legislation problems problems of physical distance and geographical borders you know the issues that people are perceiving with remote work to enable great talent to come and work with their clients Obviously, we, you know, this year is a challenge in working through a recession environment. I think for us so far, we've seen, you know, exciting growth. Companies have made that decision. They don't want a cost of employees or, you know, go and engage really expensive consultancies. So we sit neatly in the middle. So, yeah, it, it promises to be an exciting year, but I'm sure there'll be challenges around the corner that no one's perceiving yeah. right now. Yeah. We'll see how it all flows. Adam, great to talk to you today. Tell me if someone wanted to reach you, where's the best place to find you? 
Yeah, best place is either at our website, uh, launchlabconsulting.co.uk, or feel free to drop me an email, adam at launchlabconsulting.co.uk. Well, Adam, it's been great to speak. Adam is the founder of Launch Lab Consulting, which helps tech companies of any size scale their teams to deliver specific project ambitions. They work with a network of contractors and offshore partners to bring affordable, fully assess talent to their clients to help deliver their projects, augmenting their existing teams. Adam, I expect that the work in the talent market will continue to evolve, but it's exciting to hear what you guys are up to, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you, Bam. Cheers. Cheers.